we went back to the swimming club and um, I started to work my way up through the ranks. He did some years later say, I meant go for a swim, don't <laughs> swim ten times a week, but I never do anything lightly. So, as I said, I, I started to work my way up through the, through the swimming club, but I wasn't very talented, I really wasn't. There were girls my age and girls younger who were far, far better than I was. But I did realise that if I worked hard, I improved. And if I worked harder than they did, I improved quicker than they did. So from a very, very young age, I had this realisation that it, it is about hard work. And any opportunity I got, I took. So if the other girls were sneaking off for toilet breaks or cheating on their rest or missing reps, I just saw that as an opportunity to get quicker than them, start to improve faster. So for me, it was just always an opportunity. And so I'm a firm believer in the fact that hard work beats talent. And that talent is just a head start. In fact, if you look at the, the package of a successful athlete, in fact, it's successful at anything. The talent, your natural talent, your God-given talent, whatever you want to call it, is the only thing you can't do anything about. You can't change it. It's what you naturally have. You can improve your physical strength, your mental strength, your technique, your skills, but you can't do anything about the talent. So that's just a head start for some people. If you're, if you're talented and you'll work hard, then you're uh, Michael Phelps or Roger Federer. But for the rest of us, it's just a head start and those people can be caught up and that's what I realised from a very young age. I knew I wanted to be a swimmer before I was any good at it. I knew that's what I wanted to do and I set my mind to it. I had a school interview for Brighton Hove High School when I was 11 and as teachers do, I'm sure some of you have, you've said to the pupils, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, aged 11, I want to go to the Olympics and very sadly, the teacher who was interviewing me laughed in my face. And I thought, it's a little bit strange. Um, I wasn't arrogant. I didn't think I was the greatest. But I had always believed that if you worked hard at something, you could achieve. So I thought it was a little bit strange. Some years later, I had a letter from that teacher saying, I remember the school interview. I remember you sitting there saying you wanted to go to the Olympics. And I remember laughing. And she wrote that she remembered going back to the staff room and that a number of the teachers laughed about it. She actually wrote me that letter when she read in the paper I qualified for the Barcelona Olympic Games. So I did not end up having the last laugh. <laughs> but it was a, a wake-up call for me that not everyone is going to be positive. And I did start to have selective hearing and realise that you do need to surround yourself with people who support you. Not people who just say yes all the time and tell you what you want to hear, but people who will be positive and help you to achieve your goals, not, not knock you. It was tough. It was tough combining my schoolwork and swimming. It was really tough combining the two, as I'm sure Claire will testify to. It's tough putting, putting it all together. And particularly being at a girls' school, and I'll look at some of the current girls, girls <coughs> like to talk. And anything that happened at swimming got round school and vice versa because some of my teammates went to my school as well. So nothing was sacred. I used to get up in the morning to go training. I used to get up at five, go to the pool, and I used to go to school straight from swimming. So I'd get up in the morning, put my swimsuit on, go swimming. Nine times out of ten, I forgot to pack any underwear. So I went through school with the nickname, No Knickers Pickers. <laughs> That was quite a conversation I had to have with my dad when he heard. <laughs> Completely innocent. But it was hard work. And for me, the hard work was uh, 10 sessions a week in the pool of two hours. And that was about six or 7,000 metres a session. Weight training, running, Swiss ball, gym ball, press-ups, sit-ups, pretty much anything my coach could think of, I was doing. And it wasn't just about going to the pool, going through the motions, doing the lengths and going home. It was about pushing yourself to the extreme. In every single training session, it was about digging deep, about how much pain you could take in a training session to prepare for a race. Pushing yourself so hard that a few times a week, I'd be sick at the end of my lane, or I'd have to stop and tip the tears out of my goggles where I was crying from the pain, I couldn't see where I was going. 
And every single weight session, I finished with 900 sit-ups straight. And when my coach decided that was too easy, it was 900 sit-ups straight with a 10K dumbbell on my chest. On the plus side, I had great abs. <laughs> but it was, it was hard work. So a lot of people say, why do you do it? Why do you put yourself through it? Why do you go through the difficult times, the hard times? Because as we know, we seem right here today, that it's not always, not everything goes to plan. It's not always happy. It's not always the results you want. There are quite difficult times. There are times when you've been training for something, you get ill, you get injured. For whatever reason, it doesn't go to plan. The, even the greatest athletes in the world have lost more races than they've won. The likes of Steve Redgrave, Kelly Holmes, they've all lost more races than they've won. But the real testament to an athlete is how you deal with those difficult times, because it's easy to be great when things are going great, but it's how you come back when things aren't going well. And for most athletes, it's a life of highs and lows, of ups and downs. It's never just a straight ride. And we put up with those difficult times, the times when it doesn't go to plan, the times when things do go wrong, when you don't achieve what you want to, because we absolutely crave those moments when it goes right, when you get to stand on top of the medal rostrum, when you get the gold medal around your neck, when you break a record, a personal best, a world record, when whatever you set your heart to for that day, whatever you set your mind to achieve, when you just achieve that goal, it's such an amazing feeling that we're prepared to put up with the difficult times just because we'll crave those times when it all goes right. For me, the most difficult time came in 1996 when at about quarter past three on November the 15th on my way to training, which was a 10 minute car journey, I had a car accident and broke my back. At that point, I didn't know if I was ever going to swim again, let alone swim to the level I was at. And sadly, there were people within my sport who said to me, you should probably retire. You're a bit long in the tooth, I was 24. <laughs> probably your best results are behind you. They said it would be embarrassing for me to come back to swimming because people would remember me for having poor results, for not achieving and would forget that I had already become world champion, Commonwealth champion, British record holder. That that would be forgotten and people would just see me as a failure. So I thought about this for a, a few seconds and thought, I just can't do that. I can't walk away and not know. I can't sit at home and watch someone else swimming my races. I would rather fail spectacularly and have people say, I told you so, than to not know and not give it a try. Claire said it really well when she said that she felt at peace knowing that she'd done everything she could. And that's exactly what I wanted to feel. I knew I wouldn't feel peace unless I could say I gave it everything I could. So I decided I was going to carry on. It didn't take me long to decide that. It took me three years to get back to full training. And it was tough. And I was lucky that I had people around me who were immensely supportive during those three <coughs> years. Because unfortunately in sports, it's a walk of life where your results are up there for everyone to see. So up on the scoreboard where in the past it might have had my name next to first place, it was sixth, seventh, eighth. And after Karen Pickering, eighth, 200 freestyle, there was no gap where I could put, but I hurt my back. Because no one cares. No one's interested in excuses. It's all about results. So I had to believe that I was going to do better, that I was going to get better, that I would be able to train harder and that I could get back to where I was. I had to believe in myself and, and believe in the people around me that I could do that. And fortunately, I managed to, to make it back. And if I had listened to the people who said to me that I should walk away, there are two more Olympic Games I wouldn't have gone to. There are two world records I wouldn't have. And I wouldn't have uh, made it through to the Commonwealth Games in 2002 in Manchester, which were a massive goal of mine because I wanted to compete at the Commonwealth Games at home. I'm immensely jealous and bitter about the people who are heading towards London 2012. <laughs> <laughs> they have that opportunity to compete in front of a massive home crowd. But for me, it was the Commonwealth Games in Manchester. And by then, I was really, really long in the tooth. I was 30. And 
I was ranked about fifth in the Commonwealth at my best event, the 200 freestyle. So I thought perhaps my best chance of winning was behind me. I'd previously got a bronze and a silver in that event. But I also believe if you've got a lane, you've got a chance. So I went into those Commonwealth Games, as I said, ranked fifth. It was the first race on the first day of the Commonwealth Games in Manchester. And after the heats, I qualified fastest for the final. And in probably one of the proudest moments of my life, I touched the wall first in the 200 freestyle and took gold at those Commonwealth Games in front of my friends and family and my coach and the people who had believed in me. But there was a bigger race still to come that week. We were swimming the 4x200 freestyle relay against the Australians. A year before, Australia had touched the wall first at the World Championships, but one of the swimmers had jumped in the water early to celebrate before the race was over and they were disqualified, which gave Great Britain the gold medal. <laughs> <laughs> rules are rules. <laughs> so, when the Australians came over to the Commonwealth Games, they were giving it large. <laughs> they were really the best team in the world, that we hadn't really won the gold medal, blah, blah, blah. Are there any Australians? <laughs> Uh, so they were giving it large like Australians like to do and it was starting to heat up nicely with friendly banter, just like you get in the rugby and the cricket. Um, it was just starting to, to heat up nicely between the two teams. This race, the 4x200 freestyle team, as I said, was on the fourth day. It was the last race of that session. So three of our team and two of their team had already competed in uh, races in that session before which just spices the race up a little bit more because you're not quite sure how someone will have recovered, if they're going to feel it a bit from a previous race. So you're never quite sure then how the race is going to go. So we walked out for the 4x200 freestyle relay and the crowd was 4,000, but it sounded like 40,000. It was so loud and so amazing. The 4x200 relay lasts about eight minutes. And for that eight-minute race, the biggest gap between England and Australia in that relay was 0.24 of a second, which is about that much. <laughs> so for uh, eight minutes, England and Australia in the centre of two lanes with about that much separating the two teams. I was anchoring the team for England up against an Australian man. <laughs> <laughs> girl called Patria Thomas. She was actually the girl who jumped in the water early a year before to celebrate as well. So she was on a bit of a mission that night. <laughs> to be fair, Patria and I had raced each other many, many times, so we knew each other's strengths and weaknesses. She was a powerful, strong swimmer. She used to go out very, very fast and then just with grit and determination hang on in the closing <coughs> stages of a race. Whereas I, my strength was in the second half of the race. So I had to be more tactical. I had to make sure I didn't go out too fast and use my strengths, which were in the second half. So sure enough, when it came to the final leg, there was barely anything between the two teams. We pretty much dived in together. And as expected, Patria tried to move away. So I knew I had to let her go. I couldn't go with her. I couldn't let the adrenaline and the nerves and excitement make me go out too fast. But I also knew that I couldn't let her get too far ahead. I had to try and stay with her. So I sat on her shoulder for the first 50, and towards the, the end of the second 50, the halfway point, I knew this was the point that I had to go. This was where my strength was, the third 50 metres, that's when I had to go for it. So I pushed off the wall, kicked really hard, absolutely went for it, up the third 50. Started to draw alongside her, and then I started to edge ahead. Everything was going as I wanted to, I was starting to edge ahead from her, but then I was coming towards the end of that third 50, having given it everything, thinking, great, but I've got nothing left for the last length. I've absolutely finished. My arms and legs were screaming with pain. When you're side by side with someone like that in the pool, you can sense if they're tiring. You can sense if they've got anything more in the tank. You can feel it because you're swimming so close to each other. So I knew I had to make her think that I still had something to do. <laughs> so as I came into that final turn, I knew that I had to give it absolutely everything I had off the wall to make her think that I was still okay. 
So I pushed up as hard as I could, did some butterfly kicks off the wall. I know I gritted my teeth, because at the end of the race, my jaw was aching. <laughs> when I took my first breath to the left-hand side, I saw the whole of the England team down the side of the pool. The red and white flags were waving. And for the only time in my swimming career, I'm sure I could hear the crowd cheering. I was giving it absolutely everything down that last 50. I was just ahead of Petria. We were fighting it out on the last 50 metres. I was in absolute agony, but I knew at that point that's why I threw up in training. That's why I cried. That's why I did 900 sit-ups at the end of every weight session, so I could take the pain in that important race at the Commonwealth Games in Manchester. There was barely anything between us. We fought in agony, the pair of us, down that last length. And I touched the wall first, so England got the gold medal. Um, <laughs> on that night in Manchester, there was one difference between Petria and myself. When she finished the race, she climbed out. When I finished, I had to be carried out. <laughs> my teammates carried me from the pool to my interview with Sharon Davis because my legs were finished. On that night in Manchester, I wanted that gold medal more than she did. I was prepared to dig deeper than she did. Patria Thomas is a far, far more successful swimmer than I ever was. She is multiple Olympic champion, multiple world record holder, multiple world champion. On paper, I should never have beaten her on that night in Manchester. But it is amazing what you can do if you want something enough. If you're prepared to dig deep, if you're prepared to take the pain, it is amazing what you can achieve. And that race in Manchester just proved it to me. I'm very happy um, to take questions at the end, but I would just like to finish, if you're thinking about them, I would just like to finish with uh, one more uh, anecdote, if I might. I think one of the, the things that's so true in sport, in life, in business, is that it's about making the most of opportunities. And this is the best um, story, I think, that sums it up for me. My first Olympic Games were in Manchester in 19, uh, sorry, Barcelona in 1992. I was sharing a room with Sharon Davis. We had a tiny, tiny little room that was barely bigger than two single beds. We couldn't have our clothes in our room because we'd have to move a bed to open the wardrobe. So the clothes were outside. We had a little fan at the end of our bed. There was no air conditioning. You couldn't open the window. We were sharing a room like that for nearly three weeks. It was stressful. It was hot. We're girls, so we had an argument. I can't remember what it was about, but I stormed out of the apartment and went and stood between two, uh, the two tower blocks by the apartments. The way the apartments were done in Barcelona, there were tower blocks with alleyways in between. So I stood in the alleyway, bottle of water, shoulders going, all upset, don't know what about. At that point, a, a very nice Middle Eastern athlete came up to me to ask me if I was okay. He went to hand me a pin from his country, because um, at the Olympic Games, we all have pins from our country that you can swap, you can give to people who do something nice, they're quite a handy currency. I think at the closing ceremony in Barcelona, I've got a beer and a hot dog for a Great Britain <laughs> Olympic pin. So they're quite, they're quite valuable, but you're supposed to swap them. <laughs> so he very kindly came up to hand me the pin. I had my bottle of water, I held up my hand to take the pin, at which point he grabbed both my boobs, gave them a squeeze, and bezed it into his apartment block. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> But I think it's the best example I can give of seizing the moment. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not condoning groping people, but do make the most of any opportunity in your way, in any other way. Thank you very much. She's there anymore. <laughs> she 
learnt her lesson. <laughs> Thank you so much for a wonderful, inspiring talk. Yeah. Pleasure. Yeah. And that was such a wonderful talk, and it, I've just got all these sayings in my head, like, if you've got a lane, you've got a chance. <laughs> and I think we all remember about digging deep, because that just applies to so many things in life. It's just a brilliant, inspiring talk. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we've got some flowers for you as a small token of our gratitude for you coming to speak to us. Now I'm going to ask Karen and our alumni of the year to stay behind for some photographs and I'd like to invite all of you to make your way back out where there are drinks and nibbles and I just wanted to say do spread out, there's a lovely garden at that end and there is an exhibition of the 140 years of GDST straight through there so make use of all the space and thank you very much.